Can we cure aging? Immortality has been the dream of human beings, and it's been a storied part of our mythology since the earliest times. We're all familiar with the legends about a philosopher's stone that will make us immortal, or a fountain of youth that will protect us from the ravages of time. The concept of aging is shrouded in mysticism, because it's a natural part of life, and fighting against that seems impossible. But what if it's not? You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. First of all, let's define what we actually mean by aging. In some senses, to age means to increase the length of time of something's existence. Aging is sometimes synonymous with the passage of time. Certainly, we can't cure the passing of time. Time will spin on no matter how much we'd like it to stop or reverse, and we are not proposing a time machine. But another way to define aging is the effects that start to show due to the passage of time. What I'm talking about are the chemical and biological changes that happen as life progresses. So let's define aging as this. The slow accumulation of damage that eventually manifests itself in malfunction or death. For humans, these changes are initially positive. Our bodies develop, people hit puberty and evolve. But the changes eventually become crippling and terminal. A good fraction of our lives as we get older is spent in pain and suffering, as our bodies eventually lose the ability to regenerate and heal properly. So here's the real question we're asking. Is it possible to cure aging, meaning to prevent the damage that occurs to cells that leads to so much suffering in the elderly? To cure the illnesses that compromise our immune system and prevent us from healing? to fortify the body so that it can exist in its healthiest form for hundreds or even thousands of years. Kidneys! How can you kidneys? I don't like the colour. There are large swaths of the scientific community who believe that this is not only possible, but it might be possible within our lifetime. And there are a bunch of resources being poured into this research. Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong recently announced a new company, New Limit, to study longevity. He said, We want to figure out a way to restore the regenerative potential that we all had when we were younger but somehow lost. Vitalik Buterin last year gave millions to the Methuselah Foundation for aging research. Altos Labs raised a staggering $3 billion for longevity research, possibly the largest seed round in history. Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Larry Page of Alphabet, Larry Ellison of Oracle, and Peter Thiel of Palantir are all pouring money into research. This research isn't a new phenomenon, it's been continuing for millennia. What's changed is that recently there have been some major breakthroughs. We're going to look at three of them. Successful interventional studies that have extended the lifespan of animals, methylation clocks, and cell reprogramming. Let's start with interventional studies that have changed the lifespan of healthy animals. In 1993, there were famous experiments with C. elegans. These are tiny worms about one millimeter in length that live in the soil. Scientists discovered how to double their lifespan by mutating just two genes. Extending the lifespan of worms is already cool, but since then, there have been multiple studies that have consistently expanded the lifespan of mammals by feeding them rapamycin. In one study in 2009, rapamycin was fed to mice late in their life and was able to extend their lifespan by 9 to 14 percent. In another study in 2011, rapamycin was administered to mice from the age of nine months and produced significant increases in lifespan. The way rapamycin works is it attaches to something called an mTOR complex, which is a protein complex that's responsible for either putting your body into growth mode or healing mode. Now, when we're young, our body spends time in both growth and healing mode, but as we get older, it gets stuck in growth mode. The idea is to use rapamycin to manually flip mTOR into healing mode in order to restore the balance that we had when we were younger and bring back our rejuvenative capacity. The only approved use of rapamycin right now is as part of a cocktail that helps prevent rejection of new organs in transplants, and it does this by suppressing the immune system. The current experiments with rapamycin have all been in controlled lab environments, but if taken outside of that context where the patient might come into contact with any number of contagions, some researchers wonder whether there will be adverse consequences resulting from immune suppression 
or whether the immune suppression can be avoided by taking rapamycin on its own and at a lower dosage. To help shed light on rapamycin's potential impact on the immune system, there's currently an exciting trial with companion dogs, which will have the benefit of living outside of the lab in the same disease environment as humans. There are also studies underway for a drug called metformin, Metformin is actually a very safe drug that's been available on the market for decades. It's used mainly as a treatment for diabetes. Usually diabetes is a devastating illness that reduces a person's lifespan. But what's interesting is that studies have found that those on metformin consistently live longer than the average person. People who do have diabetes and who are on this drug appear to live longer than people who don't have diabetes and are not on the drug. So in other words, its benefits outweigh the, de the detriment of diabetes. That's a big deal. Aubrey de Grey is a pioneer in anti-aging research and founded SENS, a foundation for researching how regenerative medicine can be applied to aging. But despite the benefits of metformin, he says it isn't a solution for major life extension, just one of the steps along the way that could make a small difference. No one is suggesting that metformin is going to increase average lifespan by 20 years. There are some current trials to explore the potentially life-expanding benefits in humans, but the main goal of these trials isn't actually to prove that metformin increases lifespan. It's actually to pave the way for aging itself to be considered a disease that could be cured. The FDA doesn't currently recognize it as such, so the metformin trial makes concrete the language that could be used for future age-related trials, which will be a huge step forward for research in this field. That same clinical endpoint can be copied and pasted into any other trial. So that's very important. Another big breakthrough has been with the study of epigenetic clocks and the discovery that they can be reversed. What is an epigenetic clock? Well, you can think of it like a proxy for aging, a biomarker that helps tell you how old something is. Consider the rings of a tree. We use these rings to determine the age of a tree. But what if the rings were causal and each ring that gets added decreases the tree's lifespan? And even more shockingly, what if just erasing the rings actually made the tree live longer? This isn't the case with trees, but it might be with humans. Instead of rings, we have epigenetic clocks based on what's called DNA methylation patterns. Methylation is where a small molecule called a methyl group sits at the start of a strip of DNA and prevents that DNA from being read. It works like a switch, turning the gene on or off. We're born with a certain genetic makeup, but those genes aren't necessarily turned on since birth. They get triggered at different points of our life. For example, when we hit puberty, a certain gene is triggered and it activates a certain biological process. It turns out that these patterns of methyl molecules could be used to determine a person's age, similar to how a tree's age is read by its pattern of rings. This concept first came about in 2013, coined by Stephen Horvath. Be aware this isn't calculating the number of years a person has existed, but their epigenetic age, meaning which biological processes have been triggered via DNA methylation. There are many different variations of these epigenetic clocks, and some of them can be much better predictors of our lifespan than our actual chronological age. So now we have two questions. The first is, can the clock be reversed? I.e., can we edit the methyl patterns back to a former state? The answer is a strong yes. The first reversal of the epigenetic clock recorded in humans occurred in 2019 in Greg Fahey's TRIM trial. The aim of the trial was to regrow the thymus, which is an organ essential to immune function. We're all born with a thymus, but as we get older, it shrivels up and essentially disappears. Fahey wondered whether regrowing it with a cocktail of human growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin administered over the course of a year would improve the immune system of older people. The trials succeeded in regrowing the thymus, but they also had a dramatic impact on the epigenetic clock, creating the reversal of an average of 2.5 years on four different aging clock variants. The second question is whether changing the clock will actually add years to a person's life. It turns out that we don't quite understand the role that the epigenetic clock plays. Perhaps epigenetic changes that occur to your DNA are just a side effect of damage that occurs. Or perhaps epigenetic changes are causal, and this biological aging couldn't have occurred without that gene also being switched. And switching the genes back actually reverses the damage that's occurred. Then there's a big question, what if the clock is not measuring the problem, but the solution? 
Take the flu for example, when you've successfully fought the flu you end up with antibodies in your system, little biomarkers that show that you've had that flu strain. If we were to reverse this biomarker, eliminate the antibodies, it would cripple our defences against the flu. Similarly, what if the clock changed as a defence mechanism and reversing it actually hurts rather than helps? A deep understanding of the epigenetic clock is years away, but the first clues to answer our questions have started to come in. It seems that at least part of the epigenetic clock is directly responsible for ageing and reversing it will partially restore a youthful state. The final approach to combat ageing that we'll cover, which really stands out from the rest, is cell reprogramming. Cell reprogramming is behind the eye-catching $3 billion raise by Alto Labs. It's also the main focus of New Limit, Retrobio, Shift Bioscience, and many others. The idea behind cell reprogramming is that all cells in our body start from a single cell called an undifferentiated stem cell. That's what an embryo is, a single cell. Then it divides and divides again, and soon it's a cluster of cells. Eventually, the cells start being given directions like, you're going to be an eye cell, you're going to be a blood cell, start differentiating yourself and showing those characteristics. These initial stem cells have all kinds of interesting properties. They have the capacity to generate things like organs, and the body later loses that ability once the organs have already been grown and the cells are no longer stem cells. But in 2006, Shinya Yamanaka discovered that any cell can be turned into an undifferentiated stem cell. In terms of the epigenetic clock, this means that the cell's clock can be reversed back to its original state where the epigenetic age is zero. This is a really exciting discovery because it means that we might have the ability to regrow organs or heal damage that's considered degenerative and unhealable. But there are some things to consider. If you turn a cell all the way back to the epigenetic age of zero, the cell has been given no directions about what kind of cell it's meant to become. That's more than a bit too young. You start adding undifferentiated stem cells to your body and it could grow anything including things that will look a lot like cancer. So in 2020, Yoncheng Lu modified Yamanaka's process to partially reprogram a cell. And instead of taking it back to its undifferentiated embryonic state, he turns it into its youngest differentiated form so that the cell knows what it's meant to be, but still has regenerative abilities. He did an experiment with eye cells, or specifically the retinal ganglion. Very broadly, a retinal ganglion cell is a type of nerve cell located near the retina of the eye. It receives visual information and helps translate it into electrical information that the brain can understand. Generally, if your retinal ganglion is damaged, it's considered degenerative. The damage to vision is irreversible. Lou did an experiment with mice where their retinal ganglions were damaged. He used Yamanaka's research, but instead of transforming these cells back into an undifferentiated stem cell, he turns it into the youngest form of a cell that knows it's a retinal ganglion cell. These transformed cells were able to regrow and restore vision loss, a feat generally believed only to be possible by young cells. This discovery of being able to turn any cell back into an earlier form is called the Yamanaka factor, and is now being used in all kinds of experiments to see how cell reprogramming can be used to reverse aging. These experiments have also partially answered some questions about epigenetic clocks and whether the changes to them are side effects or necessary. The experiments were repeated, but this time suppressing two enzymes that are known to promote epigenetic change. Basically, if epigenetic change is just a side effect and not necessary for the rejuvenation, then suppressing epigenetic change should still rejuvenate just as well. But in the experiments, a reduction of rejuvenation was recorded. So it seems that even in these cell reprogramming experiments, epigenetic change is essential to damage reversal. Let's summarize the findings that we've covered. There have been successful experiments that increase the lifespan of all kinds of animals. So extending lifespan is possible. Epigenetic clocks predict chronological age extremely well. Epigenetic clocks are reversible, and there's evidence that this clock reversal could rejuvenate us. And we can reprogram cells to take their epigenetic age back to zero, and doing so re-enables all kinds of regenerative properties that we lose over time. Fear of aging has always plagued humanity. Aging is something that we don't quite understand, and it has a mystical inevitability about it. But there's a common mythology across cultures about demons that lose their power once the demon's true name becomes known. Your name gives me dominion over you, demon. And I do know your name. 
So perhaps we can apply this to the fear of aging. Rather than calling it aging, we can start as a society to call it by its specific names, the specific kinds of damage that occurs to cells that accumulates over time. There are likely multiple demons of aging inhabiting us, and once we know these true names, they become less mystical and we can start to focus on curing them. What will the world look like if humans are living longer and longer? There will be a lot more chronologically old people, but there will be virtually no biologically old people. Aging simply is the, by far, number one cause of suffering. It is the number one priority of the human race and therefore we have a duty to do something about it. We are entering a Copernican revolution in aging, a complete paradigm shift in how we understand life. The fact that we might be entering an era where we could alleviate the suffering of billions of elderly people, of conditions once seen unavoidable, and give them a renewed joy of life is incredibly exciting. I went to a rejuvenation clinic and got a whole natural overhaul. What do you think? You look great, Doc.